All right, awesome. Well, hello, everybody. I so wish that I was there with you all now. And I apologize as I'm looking at Charles and Sean sitting there. Looks like a million miles away, but right in my backyard. Big hugs, guys. Hope you're well. We are going to do special C20 at IEX today. And as always, we're going to start it off with some awesome music because everybody needs a break. I was watching the, the guy before with the brain break. Well, we're going to go with a spirit break right now. So Josh Geiger, my XO Marine friend, coming on to play us a little music. Josh, you got to kick up your camera. All right. Open up the mic and play I, us some music, my friend. All right. Take I it just away wanted to be ready. a voice Josh of reason Geiger. with no, no video. There it goes. <laughs> it was taking a minute. All right. Thumbs up. You can hear me OK. And we never get to hear like live applause. That's awesome. That's Josh Geiger, everybody. Um, just unbelievable. I had the pleasure of working, singing, listening to Josh for the past, I don't know, since our time walking on a highway six years from Starbucks. Welcome, everybody. Hey, hey, welcome to C20 and this awesome special Wednesday at IEX. Again, I wish I was there. Thank you, Josh, for that perfect song. But Mr. Franklin and Mr. Lure there representing, we're going to have a fabulous show today. Next year in person, I promise, today, stuck in Durham on this cloudy day. But that's all right. We are going to have some fun. All right. John's got the slides for me. We got a few slides as usual, C20 style. And then we're going to get into this transportation. Last presentation was awesome. 
everyone's doing this crazy innovative stuff now, and we're so lucky to be here in VA at this point in time. I just couldn't be more excited. Bryn, thank you for the invite and the entire team. Bron's been killing it up there. I love it. I, I just wish I was there with all my folks. Um, veteran caregiver benefits extended. If you can see that slide, maybe to your left. What I'm looking at to my left. Great things coming up uh, October. We do so much neat, neat stuff. All right, we got one more slide, John, uh, on the left. Yeah, there it is. Listen to how VA is leveraging genomics and big data to improve lung cancer. I can't see it from here, but I'm sure there's a link on there. And that looks like my, my friend from Durham, who's the director of oncology. So he's up there always talking, chatting. What a great guy. And so a great team uh, that, that'll be there. And please check them out. So we're going to go to our chai care. If you're not familiar with seat 20, we always promote and uh, just hype some great people. Like we have here, Mr. Feliciano from Puerto Rico. I'll tell you, if you haven't been to Puerto Rico and their VA, it is incredible. We always talk about, and I'm kind of jealous, you know, we have a lot of hospitals in Chicago and Durham and LA and DC, you know, is, is the, the VA hospital ever the biggest, the greatest seeing everybody? Typically it's not. We just don't have that many patients as compared to uh, DC Metro or to, you know, Chicago Harbor, whatever. But in Puerto Rico, if you've been there, the hospital is the biggest and best hospital on the island. We provide better care than anyone for everything, and I love it. And so got a, got a shout from Mr. Feliciano, part of the Utilization Management Group, driving all over the island for admissions, different towns, um, proactive treatment, vaccinations, getting people in, getting them home, getting connected with social work. And uh, we write here, Mr. Feliciano had demonstrated many times just how big his heart is by always placing, placing patient care first. So to all the PR folks, and Mr. Feliciano, thank you. Cheers and chai to you. I don't even know where my chai is. It's gone. But cheers and chai, Feliciano, to you. Fantastic. Like all the things we're talking about today. All right. Let's move on. John, we have this awesome video teed up. If you can play that video, I will mute out. And that would be fantastic. I started getting found it very I started getting, found it very frustrating um, trying to help veterans re-enter the workforce, get back on their feet, and transportation was a huge obstacle. Initially, when we started, it was just an employment problem. When we started with the pilot in 2017, uh, we were able to assist 10 veterans obtain employment that year. I felt like the end of that pilot, we finally lost someone. Since the expansion of national rollout, August third, we've actually have all 18 visits enrolled over 146 healthcare systems across the country utilizing this platform. We now have emergency department discharge running over 64 VAs across the country. We're doing inpatient discharge with follow-up transportation at over 46 VAs across the country. We have four sites using it for oncology. We have two sites using it for all dialysis patients. We have sites using it for low vision uh, yearly exams. And to date, since August 3rd, we've successfully completed over 170,000 rides nationally. That's in 53 U.S. states and territories. Transportation is the most basic social determinant for health. Unlike other healthcare challenges, this is one that we can easily solve. Love that. Thank you for that video. Got to have Charles Franklin on stage and in video right behind. <laughs> Truly fantastic. A double shot. Oh, Mr. Sean Liu. All right. Let's introduce my guests as they are sitting up there right in front of you, but 500 miles away from me. I'll start on the left on the stage, or at least to my left, and that looks to me like Mr. Charles Franklin, Project Manager for Vision One, New England Center of Innovation, Ryan Lillian team up there, Leandro De Silvo, tremendous people because I have the good fortune in emergency medicine of working with Charles and texting him on a weekly basis, hearing about this great stuff, hearing about money from Congress, hearing about the rides we're doing for veterans, and truly hearing about transportation building up social determinants in our veteran population. 
And to his left and your right, Mr. Sean Liu, who I wasn't on the last time, Sean, so we had to bring you back on when I actually get to talk to you because people are like, Sean's the next host, buddy. If you get sick, he's the guy. <laughs> so welcome, Mr. Sean Liu, Director of Communications for the VA Homeless Program. Had the pleasure of meeting Sean just, I don't know, a few months ago, working with Monica Diaz and team. Um, great show. We talked about homeless population, what we're doing in VA. I couldn't be more excited when I saw that um, Jeopardy clip talking about us, VA homeless. I don't know, Sean, if that was you or not, but regardless, truly fantastic. So we're going to kick it off today talking a little bit about that. We'll start, Sean, with you, the homeless program, and just my little soapbox here, if I'd stand up if I could. What other medical system looks at their homeless population the way we do, who goes out and goes outreach, even thinks about it, whether it's homeless, whether it's diversity, inclusion, we do so much in the VA. Innovation, this right here, it is incredible time, honestly, when you look around our leaders and the things we're doing to be in VA and, and to know that we have support and that people are great. They're up on stage wearing chucks and pearls, just talking about these amazing things that we're going to do. I think what when you see Secretary McDonough or Undersecretary Eleanor Hall up there on stage and we get to see these people as people and not just as politicians or other leaders, they become real. And by becoming real, then it allows all of us on the front lines, which is what C20 was meant to be, that ability to say, you know what? That's a cool idea. I'm going to go do it. I'm going to go innovate, like we've heard all morning and here for, you know, for the rest of the afternoon, too. That wouldn't happen if you didn't feel comfortable and safe. If you felt threatened and scared and like, oh, man, I'm going to get fired if something goes wrong. No one's ever going to be anything better than good, if that. And I think where we are now, we can get to great. And Sean and Charles are just examples of that. So, Sean, let me start to you. Tell us why transportation um, is such a major barrier for our homeless population in VA. Yeah, that's a really great question, Chad. And when you, you probably hear a little bit earlier, we're hearing Bryn uh, say a very, very staggering statistic. 3.6 million Americans forego medical care because of transportation barriers. And when you think about all the transportation barriers that we've heard today, and you add homelessness on top of that, you're basically turning it up to 11 or 12 or 13. It's really, really intense. Our communities, whether it's cities or rural areas, they were built around cars, both literally and figuratively. So when you think about the barriers that people experiencing poverty or housing instability may have, when it comes to the cost of either owning and maintaining a car or even using public transportation, that is a major barrier. Now, imagine if you're on fixed income or minimum wage or don't have an income at all and you're relying on, say, public transportation, uh, the metro or the bus, and you can't afford bus fare or the subway train fare. That's a really, really huge barrier, and it not only impacts the veterans' ability to get health care, but in the homeless service sector, it impacts our ability to get veterans housed. They can't go look for apartments if they don't have transportation. Now, all of this is pretty distressing on its own. But Chad, I want to add one other thing that's actually pretty distressing. We talk a lot about social determinants of health, but I want to talk a little bit about just dignity and, and respect for a second. When our veterans go and try to get bus fare, bus passes, passes for the subway, you know, and to try to meet our medical appointments, our homeless program activity as well, and they go to a lot of different providers, they're often met with a lot of resistance from us as social service providers, and they're called names like being manipulative, like trying to game the system, trying to take advantage, just for trying to go get the care that we all want them to get. So I, 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 I got to reiterate that because you know how many times that people came in and they talk about, well, you know, I need to get, you know, tr funding for this ride or this and that. And just like you say, so many people go to that, oh, they're just trying to get money, make that appointment for that. It is hard enough when I'm in the ED or in clinic, patients get in for their appointment on time. If they do have a ride, have a car, have a friend, um, but put on top of that, that you don't. And then the willingness to break out of this cycle from wherever you're staying, if you're lucky enough to be staying somewhere and not on the street, to go again, get a car, to get a ride, to go up, to get approached, to someone to pick you up, to get to there, you add on layers upon layers upon layers. And it's just, you get in that hole and it's so hard to dig out as, as I've seen all too many times in the ER when police bring them in, fire bring them in, somebody just a good Samaritan brings them in. Tell us, Sean, what the VA is doing to a 
address this and maybe a little bit how it's different from just community or academia or other types of medical care? Yeah, really, really great question. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that um, before a lot of the really structural big picture innovations that Charles really led, you know, to date, a lot of the transportation challenges have been addressed by our amazing social workers across the country, whether really hustling to try to get those resources for veterans or even using their own GSA fleet vehicle vans, getting veterans to and fro. But when you think about our ability to do that, then impacted by the pandemic in March 2020, public transportation not only became a uh, financial barrier, but a health barrier. It was unsafe to go into buses and, um, and subways. Remember when we thought it was originally about hand washing, and then, oh my gosh, it was actually a respiratory disease, right? So our ability for veterans to actually get around was worsened still. And this is where Charles came in, which was so innovative. Now, I want to acknowledge, and you saw this in the video, Charles has actually been on the forefront of rideshare since way in the before times, way back in 2017. We, and the homeless programs, we claim Charles a lot. I mean, he's becoming a big, a big superstar in VA these days. But he had his humble roots with us in the homeless programs as a community employment coordinator, helping veterans get jobs and utilizing rideshare in really innovative ways to get veterans jobs. And he took those initial pilot and scaled it up a little bit more and was so well positioned with a fantastic amount of infrastructure that when the pandemic hit and we needed to move from shifting rideshare to helping veterans get jobs to just helping veterans get to doctor's appointments and find housing and get to shelter, it was amazing. Now, one of the other things that I want to kind of acknowledge because uh, we get a lot of our support from Congress as well. Um, when Charles mentioned that the, uh, the really, really big takeoff of rideshare, not only for homeless programs, but across the country, when it comes to homeless programs and rideshare, we're really, really fortunate that the, I believe, this is a long name, the Johnny Davidson and David P. Rowe, I think it's Johnny Isaacson and David P. Rowe, Veterans Healthcare and Benefits Improvement Act of 2020, what a name, that passed. Section 4201 of that law really provided a lot of statutory authority for us to, at VA to use uh, appropriated funds to provide flexible assistance to veterans during public health emergencies such as the coronavirus pandemic. Now, this authority was really used for a lot of things such as um, food and shelter and um, actually some really, just as an aside, some really innovative folks during the Pacific Northwest heat wave bought some AC units. I'm from Florida. The fact that people don't have AC units is bizarre to me, but I don't know that. But it also allows us to use appropriated funds for transportation. Now, you don't need me to tell you that just because you have the authority to do something doesn't mean you have the ability to do it, the infrastructure. And so we're so grateful that Charles actually had all of that infrastructure already in place, that all we needed to do was actually fund him appropriately to scale up operations. And so I think really at this stage, the, the, the in, inside of what VA is doing about it really falls on Charles. So fantastic, and I, I remember that that fateful call one day from Charles, uh, and many conversations since. And I can share a story that can be repeated thousands of times over from me, from so many of my colleagues. As someone sits in my emergency department after their discharge for two, four, six, eight, ten hours a day because they have they have nowhere to go. And that's great if you're at some community private hospital that are like. You can go have a seat outside, Mr. Lou, and you know, wait for your ride. We don't do that because we're awesome in VA. And whether it's in the emergency department or inpatient, people stay because they don't have rides, and that's very real. Not only is that taking a bed from somebody else, but it's potentially putting veterans and patients at harm because of increased risk of infection when they're staying another day. And that's when I remember hitting up Charles and him out up me and said, we could do so much because we have a problem. And he said, Chad, I'm here to solve that problem. Charles. Take me from the homeless situation to where you went to, whether ED, whether GI lab, people getting rides, inpatient admissions. Talk a little bit about how this program has expanded. Absolutely. Uh, before I get into the expansion, the first thing I'd like to touch up on a little bit, on the 4201, and I feel like it's the most important piece here. We don't want to get wrapped up too much in this with transportation to meet the needs during the pandemic. Me and Sean were on the phone having calls, developing that proposal toward the legislative authority before COVID even existed. We sent that proposal to Congress the summer before COVID even started. So transportation was a barrier and all this was something we're addressing before the pandemic. And just because COVID's coming and going, 
doesn't mean that transportation barrier is going to disappear with it. Um, so the expansions outside the homeless program, it actually started um, primarily with Kim Balecki out of Vision 8, the Orlando Healthcare System Innovation Specialist. The, they had a report come up, the Vision 8 director reached out to Kim and was like, is there something we can do? Kim, being very eager and as wonderful of an innovation specialist she is, reached out and said, hey Charles, can we use Rodchair for this? Well, the infrastructure was in place. We had funds in which we could utilize for those purposes. So I'm like, yes, sure. So the Orlando Healthcare System championed the emergency department, which is how has been my process throughout every expansion working with those frontline providers. I have over 7,000 emergency department social workers, homeless program social workers, nurses, AODs, MSAs, utilizing this platform across the country. I've had calls with them on a weekly basis. I'll have visiting calls almost every day, scheduled. Our frontline staff are developing this platform, not me. I just put on my listening ear, take their feedback, and that's how we meet the need. So once a window developed, that standardized process, the toolkit, Kim replicated the 12 sites. At that point, success, easy replication. I, I had to give our window, unfortunately, their um, innovation specialist back, but I was then able to take the emergency department uh, project and scale it across the entire enterprise. And we're talking about 30-day implementation. It took me 30 days to implement across 145 healthcare system for the homeless program. So the platform is that efficient. And the artificial intelligence-driven platform, that is the real innovation. We're able to do predictable outcomes, add multiple transportation providers, meet all those uh, social determinants of health, not just transportation, food insecurity. So, and some other social determinants. And that's kind of where our expansions have been going. It's about allowing those frontline staff to provide wraparound services and meet the veterans' needs where they are. It's more than just transportation. Yeah. Charles, a lot of that is that platform you talk about. I want you to dive in. We got time for this last question. We're going to do some music and, and get on back to the program. But talk a little bit about the AI, the artificial intelligence of the platform, and like you said, the scalability that makes this so great. So it's allowing us to pinpoint uh, basically across the country, day, time of the day, which platform is going to be the most efficient, which is going to give us the highest reliability and outcome. We're identifying the rural areas where there isn't really access uh, on the Rodshare platform. So we're able to, on the platform, bring on other transportation companies so it can identify by that zip code, like, oh, these main companies aren't an option. The platform will do all the work. And by doing one national contract, through that third party provider with the ability to bring on multiple transportation com companies across the country. With that platform, we are providing what I see as health equity, regardless of that healthcare systems or that site size, whether they're three, two, or one, I'm providing every VA facility across the country the same access to the same resources to provide that same quality of care to every veteran. And that's the goal. It's like that one artificial intelligence platform just becomes more efficient over time. The more it's used, the better we get. And if you gave this to 100 people, you get 100 different ideas about what we can do. Again, you talk to an ER doc. That's why we're doing this ER program. But happens to also see problems in the GI lab, inpatient admissions. Sky's the limit on this because, again, you have that core and it can build from there. Absolutely awesome. Charles Franklin, Sean Lee, you guys are terrific. Keep innovating. Keep being on so, Jeopardy. Keep smiling. We got one more yes. thing, Chad. Go. Go, Charles. Um, if I can, 
I want to introduce you to my new partner and make an announcement on our newest effort on what we're bringing onto the platform. Come on up here. You know uh, Dr. Priya Joshi from San Francisco? Hello. It's on. I hope it's working. If not, I can I'll just you. speak very loudly. <laughs> yep, we can hear you. Uh, as, so, oh yeah. All right, so we're happy to say uh, through the Office of Mental Health and Substance Use uh, Disorders Program, we just contracted a couple weeks ago $35 million for all their veterans, transportation to all SUD treatment, RTP programs across the country regardless of distance, and we're able to utilize for those veterans food as medicine, which Dr. Joshi will be leading that effort and talk a little bit about the food security piece for this population. Uh, very excited to be working with you. I think one thing that I really love about Charles is he has a vision for the future where veterans can get all the care they need as whole people. He built an empire with Rideshare to make sure that any veteran can get to care, to appointments, back home, wherever they need to be to get care for themselves. He and I partnered together to create a complimentary program called Food Share that ensures any veteran who has a substance use disorder funded by, is able to get groceries directly to their doorstep. There is no veteran who should go hungry. There's no person out there who should go hungry without services from their healthcare organization. And the VHA, a high reliability, whole person centric organization, will be one of the first and the largest healthcare organizations to significantly invest in the idea that food is medicine. So I wanna thank the Mental Health Office and Charles Franklin. The Mental Health Office is giving us $35 million to make sure that any veteran with substance use disorders, as a start, can get that transportation access and that food access. This is like this is like a drop the mic where you know like Steve Jobs comes out and like drops the new <laughs> iPhone 14. One more thing. <laughs> Thirty-five million dollars. Sean, did you have something you want to add? Go. No, no, no. I was just going off that Steve Jobs room. Was one more thing. Wait, one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> Oprah yep. is gonna they're gonna start throwing out like fresh express things and you get one and you get one. So that's awesome. Hopefully no Sean idea. gets his mic drop in two weeks with that permanent <laughs> authority. You guys are all incredible. Um, thank you, Priya. It's great to see you up there. And uh, Charles, Sean, just magical what you're doing. We always drop cool things on C20 and IEX, 35 million. I know the homeless and the food insecurity people are just great and they must be falling over backwards about this too. But the way you guys talk about it is great. Food share, building and all. All this is is just taking one idea and building and building and you can go so many. So, all right, we're out of here. C20, thanks you, IES. Next year in person, I promise.